Well, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, or good evening for those that are connected online from different time zones. Very happy to be here with you in uh, Kyoto. It's the first time in Japan, so I'm very excited to be in this uh, fantastic place. My name is Thomas. Um, I work for the Swiss government, and I happen to currently chair the negotiations uh, on the first binding AI treaty at the Council of Europe. That is a treaty not just for European countries, it is open to all countries that um, respect and value the same values of human rights, democracy, and rule of law. So we do have uh, countries like uh, Canada, the United States, Japan as well participating in the negotiations, but also a number of countries from Latin America, from other continents. But I'm not here to talk about the convention right now that will, you will hear a lot about the convention, maybe also in this session, but also in others. But I'm here to basically help you listen to uh, experts from all over the world that will talk about <clears throat> AI and how to ensure, while fostering innovation, how to ensure human rights uh, and democratic values to be respected when AI is used and developed. So, um, as we all know, AI systems are wonderful tools if they are used for the benefit of all people and uh, if they are not used for uh, hurting people, for creating harm. And so this is uh, about how to try and make sure that one thing happens and the other does it. But before we go to the panelists, I have the honor to present to you a very special guest from Strasbourg, uh, Mr. Björn Berge. He's the Deputy Secretary General of the Council of Europe, which will hold, uh, give you a few remarks from his side on the topic. Thank you, Björn. Please go ahead. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Ambassador Schneider, and a very good afternoon to all of you. It's uh, really great to be here in Japan and at this very important uh, uh, occasion. And, uh, okay. and uh, of course, it's uh, 17 years now, and it's the 18th time that the IGF is meeting. And it has really proven to be both a historic and highly relevant decision uh, to start this process. And uh, technology is, as we know, developing in a way and at a pace that the world has never seen before, which affects all of us, every country, every community around this globe. It therefore makes really perfect sense to keep up the work and, and do all we can to ensure enhanced digital cooperation and the development of a global information society. Basically, this is about uh, working together to identify and mitigate common risks so that we can make sure that the benefits that the new technology can bring to our economies and societies are indeed helpful and respect fundamental rights. Today, it is uh, good to see the Internet Governance Forum making substantial progress towards a global digital compact, with human rights established as one of the principles in which digital technology should be rooted, along with the regulation on artificial intelligence, all to the benefit of people throughout the world. The regulation of uh, AI is also something on which the Council of Europe is uh, making good progress. In line with our uh, mandate to protect and promote common legal standards in human rights, democracy and rule of law. And the work we do is not only relevant for Europe alone, but has often a global outreach. So, uh, dear friends, I believe all of us are fully aware of the positive changes that AI can bring. Increased efficiency and productivity with mundane and repeated tasks moving from humans to machines. Better decisions even. 
made on the basis of big data, eliminating the possibility of human error, and improved services based on deep analysis of vast quantities of information leading to scientific and medical breakthroughs that seemed impossible until very recent times. But with all of this comes significant right-based concerns. And just as a matter of fact, uh, a few days ago, the Council of Europe published a study on tackling bias in AI systems to promote equality. And I'm uh, very happy and pleased that the co-author of this excellent study, Ms. Ivana Bertoletti, is here with us today online, and she will speak after me, I think. So uh, there are also other questions related to the availability and use of personal data, on the responsibility for the technical failure of AI applications, and on their criminal misuses in attacking election systems, for example. And on access to information, the growth of hate speech, fake news and disinformation, and how these are managed. The bottom line is that we must find a way to harness the benefits of AI without sacrificing our values. So how can we do that? Our starting point should be the range of internet governance tools that we have already agreed upon, some of which have a direct bearing on AI. If I focus on Europe for a moment, this includes the European Convention on Human Rights, which has been ratified by 46 European countries. Also the European Court of Human Rights, with its important case law. And let me just mention one concrete example now from such a court judgment. A case that clarified that online news portals can be held liable for user-generated comments if they fail to remove clearly unlawful content promptly. This is a good example of the evolution of law in line with the times. Drawing from this European Convention and the court case law, uh, which of course again builds on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we also develop specific legal instruments designed to help member states, but also countries outside Europe, apply our standards and principles in regards to internet governance. Our Budapest Convention is the first international treaty to combat cybercrime including offenses related to computer systems, data, and content. And its new second edition of protocol is designed to improve cross-border access to electronic evidence, extending thereby the arm of justice further into cyberspace. <coughs> Our Convention 108 on data protection is similarly a treaty that countries also inside and outside Europe, find highly relevant. And this convention on data protection has also been updated with an amending protocol, widely referred to as Convention 108 Plus, which helps ensure that national privacy laws converge. Added to this, over recent years, we have, within the Council of Europe, adopted a range of recommendations to all our 46 member states, covering everything from combating hate speech, especially online, to tackling disinformation. And right now, we are also working on a set of new guidelines on countering the spread of online mis- and disinformation through fact-checking and platform design solutions. In addition, we are now looking at the impact of digital transformation of the media, and this year we will finalize work on a set of new guidelines for the use of AI in journalism. So all in all, 
we are indeed involved in a number of areas trying to help and contribute. But we need to go further still on AI specifically. And here we are currently developing a far-reaching and first of its kind international treaty, a framework convention. And the work is led by Ambassador Schneider sitting next to me that will define a set of fundamental principles to help safeguard human rights, rule of law, and democratic values in AI. Experts from all over Europe, as well as civil society, representatives from the private sector, are leading and contributing to this work. Such a treaty will set out common principles and rules to ensure that design development and use of AI systems respect common legal standards and that they are rights compliant through their life cycle. Like the Internet Governance Forum, this process has not been limited to the involvement of governments alone and this is crucially important because we need to draw upon the unique expertise provided by civil society participants, academics, and industry representatives. In other words, we must always seek a multi-stakeholder approach, so as to ensure that what is proposed is relevant, balanced, and effective. Such a new treaty, a framework convention, will be followed by a standalone, non-binding methodology for the risk and impact of AI systems to help national authorities adopt the most effective approach to both regulation and implementation of AI systems. But it's also important to say here today that all of this work is not limited only to the Council of Europe or our member states. The European Union, is also engaged with the negotiations as well as non-European countries, as well as Canada, the United States, Mexico and Israel. And this week, Argentine, Costa Rica, Peru and Uruguay joined. And of course, Japan, a country that has been a Council of Europe observer for more than 25 years and that is actively participating in the range of our activities. And there is no doubt that Japan's outstanding expertise and track record of technological development makes it a much valued participant in our work. And its key role globally when it comes to AI and internet governance is only reconfirmed by hosting this important conference here in Kyoto this week. So dear friends, there is still time for other like-minded countries to join this process of negotiating a new international treaty on AI, either taking part in the negotiations or as observers. A role that actually a number of non-member states have requested. And I must say, the negotiations are progressing well. A consolidated working draft of the Framework Convention was published this summer, and it will now serve as the basis for further negotiations. And yes, our aim is that we should be able to conclude these negotiations by next year. I hope you agree. Let me also underline that this framework convention will be open to signature from countries around the world. So it will have the potential for a truly global reach, creating a legal framework that brings European and non-European states together, opening the door, so to say, to a new era of right-based AI around the world. So let me here just make an appeal to governments represented here today to consider whether this 
is a process that they might join, and a treaty that they most likely will go on to sign. Just as I encourage those who have not yet done so to join the Budapest Convention and the Convention 108 and 108 Plus, as I just mentioned. I believe it makes sense to work closely together on these issues and make progress on the biggest scale possible. Let me lastly on this point just say, and more broadly, that on the regulation of artificial intelligence, we can learn from each other, benefit from various experiences, and tap into a large pool of knowledge and expertise globally. For us, the Council of Europe, it's seeking multilateral, uh, multilateral solutions to multilateral problems is really part of our DNA. And that spirit of cooperation make it natural for us to work with others with an interest in these issues as well. And I also want to highlight here today that we also work now very closely with the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers to elaborate a report on the impact of the metaverse and immersive realities. And we are also looking then carefully into the, if the current tools are adequate for ensuring human rights, democracy, and rule of law standards in this field. We are also coordinating closely with UNESCO, as well as, well as with the OECD, with the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and the European Union, of course. And I believe also why we are here today as the Internet, Internet Governance Forum, we share that spirit and that ambition of international cooperation. And this is really the only approach for us, and I'm sure its success is a must, both for the development of artificial intelligence and for helping to shape the safe, open, and outward-looking societies that hope, hold and protect fundamental rights and are true to our values. So with this, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Bjorn. And you said it, the key of us being together here is to learn from each other. Uh, which means uh, listening and trying to understand each other's situation. And uh, we're very happy to have uh, quite a range of, of uh, experts with different expertise here on the panel, but of course also in the room. So I'm looking forward to, a, to an interesting exchange. And I will immediately go, you've already named her, to Ivana Bartoletti. Um, she's connected online. So we uh, have this uh, uh, advantage after COVID that we can uh, co connect with people uh, physically here, but also remotely, and uh, Ivana Bartoletti works in a major private company, specialized, among other things, in IT consulting. She's also a researcher and teaches cybersecurity, security, privacy, and bias at Pamplin Business School at Virginia Tech. And Ivana is a co-founder of the Global Coalition for Digital Rights and Women Leading in AI Network. So Ivana, please tell us about your work. What would you say are the main challenges when it comes to bias, and in particular gender bias in AI, and what do you think we need to develop, to do and develop and foster the appropriate solution to these problems? So Ivana, I hope you will appear Thank on our so screen much. soon. Thank yes, we can already hear you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for having me here. And it was great to hear from both yourself in the introduction and Mr. Bjorn Berge and um, Deputy General Secretary um, of the Council of Europe. Well, I want to thank for the trust in, in, in given to, to me and to Raffaele and uh, putting together um, this, this report, which is now available online. I wanted to start by saying that artificial intelligence is bringing and will bring enormous innovation and progress if we do it in the right way. And I do firmly believe, as many 
and we are at a watershed moment in the relationship between humanity and technology. This is the time, and the Deputy General, Secret Secretary General of the Council of Europe, Bjorn, was really articulating it well. We are at a watershed moment in this relationship between humanity and technology. Over the last few years, we've seen some of the amazing benefits that artificial intelligence, automated decision-making can bring to humanity. But the, on the other hand, we've also seen some quite disturbing sites. We've also seen some quite disturbing effects that these technologies can bring. Um, and uh, bias, the perpetuation, the codification, the coding and the automation of existing inequality is, is been one of them. And I want to make one point as we start. Um, and the point that I want to make is that over the last few years, and sorry, over the last few weeks and months, we have seen a lot of people coming out with quite alarmist and dramatic um, appeals on artificial intelligence. And I want to say loud and clear here in this in this in this room, and that um, this alarmist approach to artificial intelligence is being quite um, distracting. Um, and the reason for this is that it, it helps create a mystique around artificial intelligence. Well, we know very, very well right now what the risks are. We've been advocating and especially have to say women and human rights activists over the last decade um, for measures uh, to tackle these arms. So I want us and, and everybody to remain focused on artificial intelligence risks and harms, do the nitty gritty, as the Council of Europe mentioned now, as a lot of work is going, for example, in the European AI Act, in the development of legislation and guidance all across the, the world, in the work going in the Convention for the Council of Europe, as well as in the world that the United Nations with the, the, the Digital Global Comp Compact is, is putting forward, um, to really focus on the harms that we know of, on the harms of bias, disinformation, um, the coding of, of existing inequalities in automated decisions, making choices about individuals now, but also, also making predictions about decisions tomorrow. So in these studies, um, Raphael and I have focused on um, bias and auto in automated decision making and looking at what this bias looks like. There's been a lot of work going into this from and a lot of expertise all around the globe focus, focusing on, 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 uh, on, uh, on uh, the bias. And we have seen that this bias has a very real effect. We've seen less credit given to women because women traditionally make less money than men. We've seen countries and government grappling with the terrible mistakes of, for example, families um, wrongfully, wrongfully identified as potential fraudsters in, in the benefit system and therefore putting families, parents and children into poverty. We have seen what it means when um, job adverts target the pay less, pay women, uh, are served to, to, to women because traditionally women have earned less than men. And we have seen the harms of automated decision making for example, um, um, portraying images of women replicating stereotypes that we have seen for decades in, in our society. So the harms of automated decision making and of bias um, is all too real for people. It affects every day's life. And some people would argue, yes, but human, bi human people are biased. And I say, yes, they are biased. Obviously they are, but the difference is where that bias gets coded into software and it becomes more difficult to identify, more difficult to challenge, and then it becomes ingrained even more in our society. And this is particularly complex in my view when it comes to predictive technologies, which if we code this bias and these stereotypes into these predictive technologies, that what could happen is that we end up into self-fulfilling prophecies. We end up into replicate, replicating the patterns of yesterday's into decisions that shape the world of tomorrow. And this is not something that we want. So what 
can we do? First of all, we must recognize the bias can be addressed from a technical standpoint, can be addressed from a technical standpoint, but bias it is much deeper than that. It's much more than a technical issue. It's rooted into society because data, as well as parameters, as well as all the humans that go into creating a code, is much more than technology. Ultimately, I like to say that uh, AI is a bundle of code, of parameters, of people, of data, and nothing of that is neutral. Therefore, we must understand that these tools are much more of a socio-technical tool rather than, than a purely technical one. So it's important to bear in mind that the origin and the cause of bias, which could emerge at any point of the life cycle of AI, is not is a social political issue that requires social answers, not purely technical ones. So let's never lose this from our conversation. Second thing that is important to realize, we found in the study with Raphael, that there is often not an overlap between the discrimination that people experience, which, in, which traditionally, especially in non-discrimination law across the world, are based on protected characteristics and the new sources of discrimination that are often algorithmic. And the algorithmic discrimination, which is created by uh, big data sets, the, the sort of clustering of individuals um, done in a computational and algorithmic way. And on the other hand, the more traditional categories um, of, of discrimination, they do not overlap. And therefore, what is happening is that we must look into existing non-discrimination law and try and understand if that non-discrimination law that we have in place in our countries is fit for purpose to deal with this new form of algorithmic discrimination. Because what happens in algorithmic discrimination is that individuals may be discriminated, not because of a traditional protected characteristics, but because they've put, they've been put um, in a particular cluster, in a particular group from, uh, and this happens in a computational and an algorithmic way. Then, so the updating of existing legislation is very important. We encourage member states to expand the use of positive action measures to tackle algorithm discrimination and use the concept of positive obligations, which is, for example, in the European Convention of Human Rights case law, to create an obligation for providers and users to reasonably prevent algorithmic discrimination. This is really, really important in, in part in, in our report. We are looking and we are suggesting mandatory discrimination risk and the quality impacts assessments throughout the life cycle of algorithmic systems according to their specific uses. We are looking really to see to, to, to ensure that um, the, this equality by design is, is introduced into, into the systems. We are looking and we are suggesting to member states to consider how certification mechanisms could be used to ensure that the, the, this bias have been mitigated. So looking, for example, at how member states could introduce some form of, of, of licensing and saying, hey, well, actually, this systems, this has been in, in uh, due diligence has been into the systems um, to um, eliminate as far as possible uh, for, for well-defined users. Um, we are looking at in encouraging um, encouraging um, the uh, member state to investigate the relationship between accountability, transparency, and trade secrets. And finally, my last point, and we've we've encouraging member states to consider establishing legal obligations for users of AI systems to publish statistical data that can allow parties, researchers, to really look at the discriminatory effect that a given system can have in the context of discrimination claims. So I want to close on this. It's a vast report that I would encourage anyone to read. And the bottom line of this report is that um, the discrimination through um, AI systems 
um, is something that brings together social tech, social and technical capabilities. It's something that it needs to absolutely be at the heart, at the heart of how we deploy these systems. We must investigate the way that we can use the systems to actually tackle the discrimination in the first place. For example, by identifying sources of discrimination that are not visible to, to, to human to human eyes in the first place. So there is a positive side to all this, which, which, which we must harness. But to do so, we encourage everyone to really understand how we can get together, bring the most the greatest expertise that we have in the world and, and in this room to really try and understand how we can not just further our knowledge, but also enshrine in legislation the importance to tackle um, bias in, in um, algorithmic systems. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Ivana. And as you say, uh, new technologies create new problems sometimes, but they can also be part of new solutions, and it's good to to highlight both. Uh, with this, let me uh, move on immediately as we are slightly running behind schedule to uh, Ms. Merve Hickok. She's also connected online. We do, as you see, also have uh, physically present speakers and experts. Uh, Merve is a glo uh, globally renowned expert on AI policy, ethics, and governance, and her research and training and consulting work focuses on the impact of AI systems on the individual society public and private organizations with a particular focus on fundamental rights, democratic values, and social justice. She is the president and research director at the Center for AI and Digital Policy. And uh, with this uh, hat, she's also very actively present as one of the uh, very uh, present civil society voices in the negotiations on, on the convention. So Mary, what are some of the main challenges of finding proper regulatory solutions to the challenges posed by AI to human rights democracy and what kind of solutions to these challenges do you see? Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for the invitation, Chairs, uh, Chair Schneider. Uh, look good to see you in uh, virtually and uh, I appreciate the invite and expanding this conversa conversation in this global forum as well. Uh, also, I'm in great company here today and very much looking forward to the conversation. I actually want to answer the question by quoting from recommendation of Committee of Ministers of Council of Europe, dating back to 2020, uh, where the ministers recommend that achievement of socially beneficial innovation and economic development goals must be rooted in the shared values of democratic societies, subject to full democratic participation and oversight, that the rule of law standards that govern public and private relations, such as legality, transparency, predictability, accountability, and oversight, must also be maintained in the context of algorithmic systems. So this sentence alone, uh, for me, provides us with a great opportunity, great summary of challenges, as well as an opportunity and direction towards solutions. First, in terms of challenges, we currently see a tendency to treat innovation and protection as a either or situation, as a zero sum game. I cannot tell you the number of times I'm asked, but would regulating AI stifle innovation? And I'm sure uh, those in the room and around in the, in the panel probably has lost count of this question. However, they should coexist, they must coexist. Regulation creates clarity safeguards making innovations better, safer, more accessible. Genuine innovation promotes human rights. It promotes engagement, it promotes transparency. Second challenge uh, in this field that we're seeing is that the rule of law standards which govern public actors use of AI systems must apply to the private actors as well. It feels like Every day you see another privately owned AI product undermining rights or access to resources. Yes, of course, there are differences in the nature of duties between private and public actors. However, businesses also have obligation to respect human rights and rule of law too. This is reflected in the United Nations guiding principles for, guiding principles for business, reflected in the Hiroshima process for AI now. We cannot overlook 
how the private sector's use of AI impacts individuals and communities, just because we want our domestic companies to be more competitive. Market competition alone will not solve this problem with human rights and democratic values. Unregulated competition might encourage a race to the bottom. And the third challenge, the final challenge is the CEO and industry dominance in the regulatory conversations we're seeing around the globe today. As ministers note, innovation must be subject to full democratic participation and oversight. We cannot create regulatory solutions behind closed doors with industry actors deciding whether or how they should be regulating. Of course, the industry must be part of this conversation. However, democracy requires public engagement. Whether it's in the US, UK, or beyond, you're seeing the dominance of industry in the policymaking process, undermining the democratic values, and it's likely to exacerbate existing concerns about replication of bias, displacement of labor, concentration of wealth, and power imbalances. And as I mentioned, the, the challenge, uh, the minister's recommendation actually include the, include the solutions with them that we need to base our solutions in democratic values. In other words, civic engagement and policy, civic engagement and policy making in elections, in governance, transparency and accountability. I would like to finish very quickly uh, with some recommendations uh, because core uh, democratic values and human rights is core to the mission of my organization. We saw these challenges several years ago and set ourselves up for a major project to objectively assess AI policies and practices across countries. Our annual flagship report is called AI and Democratic Values Index. We published the third edition to the, uh, this year uh, where we assessed 75 countries against 12 objective metrics, where our metrics actually allow us to assess whether and how these countries see the importance of human rights and democracy and whether they keep themselves accountable for their commitments to these. In other words, do they walk the talk? Uh, you would be surprised to see how many commitments in a national strategy does not actually translate to actual practices. So I'm uh, finishing my response with offering recommendations from our annual report over the three years that I hope will be applicable to this conversation. Uh, first, establishing national policies for AI that implement democratic values. Second, ensure public participation in AI policymaking and create robust mechanisms for independent oversight of AI systems. Third, guarantee fairness, accountability, and transparency in all AI systems, public and private. Four, commit these principles in the development, procurement, and implementation of AI systems for public services where a lot of the time that uh, middle one procurement uh, falls between the cracks. Next recommendation is implement the UNESCO AI recommendations on ethics. And then the final one in terms of uh, implementation is establish a comprehensive legally binding convention for AI. And I do appreciate the Council of Europe being part of the Council of Europe's work uh, and looking forward to this uh, convention for AI. And then we have two specific, two specific uh, recommendations for specific technologies because they undermine both human rights and democratic values and civic engagement. One is the uh, facial recognition for mass surveillance. The second one is deployment of auto little autonomous weapons, both items that have been repeatedly also expressed you know, uh, discussed in UN negotiations, you know, UN conversations. With that, uh, I, I would like to thank again and looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you, Mary. That was very interesting, in particular, also <clears throat> this fight against the notion that you can have either innovation or protection of rights, but both need to go together. With this, let me turn to uh, <clears throat> Francesca Rossi. She's also present online. She's a computer... By the way, have you noticed we have quite many women here on this panel, so uh, for those that... 
uh, complained that <clears throat> you don't find any women specialists. Um, actually, sometimes you do. So Francesca Rossi is a computer scientist currently working at the IBM TJ Watson Research Law in New York and as an IBM fellow and IBM AI ethics global leader. She's actively engaged in the AI-related work of bodies like the IEEE, the European Commission High-Level Expert Group, or the Global Partnership on AI, and she will give us a unique perspective as both a uh, computer scientist and a researcher, but also as someone who knows the industry's perspective on the challenges and on the opportunities created by AI, and more especially on generative AI. You have the floor, Francesca. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this invitation and for the opportunity to participate in this panel. Um, so um, many of the things that have been said by the previous speakers uh, resonate with me. So uh, like uh, I can, you know, of course, everything that Ivana said about the social technical aspects of this uh, uh, science and technology that is AI by in several years now that AI is not a science or a technology only, but is really a social technical field of study. Uh, and that's a very important point to make. Um, I, I really uh, uh, support you know, the efforts that uh, the Council of Europe and the European Commission are doing in terms of regulating AI as in my company and myself, I really feel that uh, regulation is important to have and it does not stifle innovation, as it was said also previous, the, by the previous speaker. Um, but regulation should be focusing, in my view, on the uses of the technology rather than the technology itself. The same technology can be used uh, in many different ways. Uh, in many different application scenarios, some of them that are very, very low risk or no risk at all, and some others instead that they are very, very high risk. So we should uh, make sure that we focus where the risk is and to put obligations and compliance and uh, uh, scrutiny and so on. Um, I would like to share with you the fact uh, how what 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 happened during the last years in a company like IBM, which is a global company and uh, has applications of its technology and deployment of its technology to many different sectors of uh, of our society. Um, so uh, and and what we did inside the company, even though there was and there is in some regions of the world no regulation that really to be compliant with around AI is because we really feel that regulation is needed, but it cannot be the only solution. Also because technology goes much faster than the legisl legislation process. So companies have to, play, have to play their role and their part in making sure that the technology they build and they deploy to their clients respects the human rights and uh, freedom and human dignity and uh, gen and bias and many others. So the, the lessons that uh, we have learned in these years are very few, but I think very important. First of all, that a company should not have a, a, an AI ethics team. This is something that maybe is natural to have at first, but is not effective in my view, because having a team means that then the team has to usually struggle to, com to connect with all the business units of the company. So what it must have is a company-wide approach and framework for AI ethics and uh, a centralized governance for that company-wide fra uh, framework. For example, in, the, in our case, in the form of a board with representations from all the business units. Second thing, this board should not be an advisory board. It should be a, a, an entity that can make decisions for the company, even when the decisions are not well received by some of the teams. Because for example, it says, no, you cannot sign that contract with a client. You have to do some more testing. You have to pass the threshold for bias. You have to uh, put some contractual uh, uh, conditions in the contractual agreements and so on. Um, the, second, the, the third thing that we learned is that we started like everybody 
with very high level principles around AI ethics, but then we realized uh, very soon that we needed to go much deeper into the concrete actions. Otherwise, there was no impact from the principles to what the developers uh, and the consultants were doing. Next, uh, next one is uh, really the socio-technical part. For a technical company, it's very natural to think that uh, an issue with the technology can be solved with some more technology. And uh, of course, technical tools are very important, but they are the easy part. The important and the most important and complementary part to the technical tools is the education, the risk assessment processes, the developers' guidelines, really changing the, the culture and the frame of mind of everybody in the company around the technology. Next point is the importance of research. AI research can uh, augment the capabilities of AI, but it can also help in addressing some of the issues related to the current limitations of, of AI. Some, and, and, and that's very important, so to really focus on uh, supporting uh, the research efforts. We also have to remember the technology evolves. So over the years, our framework has evolved because of the new challenges and the expanded challenges uh, uh, that came about with the evolution of the technology and with going from a technology that was just rule-based to based on machine learning and then based on generative AI right now, which expands old issues like like issues related to fairness, explainability, and robustness, but also creates new ones, right? Uh, it was mentioned, misinformation, fake news, uh, copyright infringement, and so on. And then finally, the value of partnerships. So partnerships that are multi-stakeholder, that are global, and as, as uh, Deputy Secretary mentioned, this is really a very important and, and, and necessary approach. It has to be inclusive, multi-stakeholder, and global. So I've been working with the OECD, with the World Economic Forum, with the partnership on AI, global partnership on AI. The space is very crowded now, but uh, and we have to make an effort because of this crowded space to find the complementarity and how to work together. So each initiative tries to solve the whole thing, but I think that each initiative has its own uh, angle that is very important and complementary to the other ones. Um, so I'll, I'll stop here by saying that I really welcome what the Council of Europe is doing uh, under the leadership also of our moderator, but also I welcome what the UN is doing and is trying to do with the new advisory board that is being built, because really the UN can also play an important role in making sure that AI is driven in the right direction, which is guided by the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca, for sharing uh, w with us the lessons learned in a company like, like IBM from an industry perspective, but also I think a very important uh, guidance is an appeal to uh, intergovernmental institutions and other processes to not all try to solve all problems at once, but to each of the processes and institutions focus on their specific strength and try to jointly solve the problems and uh, together. Thank you very much. With this, let us move. And this is our last online speaker. Then we do have the, uh, the physical speakers here. Professor Daniel Castaño. Uh, he comes from the academic world. He's a professor in law in the Universidad Externado de Colombia, but has a strong background in working with government. He's been a former legal advisor to different ministries in Colombia and actively engaged in the uh, AI-related research and work in Colombia and Latin America in general. He's also an independent consultant on AI and new technologies. So, Daniel, what kind of specific challenges do AI technologies pose for regulators and developers of these technologies regionally, in your case, in Latin America in particular? Thank you very much, Daniel. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished delegates and fellow participants, Deputy Secretary General, both Bjorn Jürgen Birch and uh, Chair of this, Kai Thomas Schneider. Thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, I think that the best way to address this question is uh, just trying to discuss like the profound importance of, of AI regulation. 
today I must make clear that I'm speaking with my own voice and that my remarks uh, reflect my personal views around this topic. So AI, as we know it, is no longer just a buzzword or a distant concept from enhancing healthcare diagnosis to making financial markets more efficient. AI is deeply embedded in our societal fabric. Yet like any transformative technology, it, its immense power brings forth both promises and challenges. But why, you may ask, is AI regulation so paramount not only to Europe, but to the world and to our region, to Latin America? At its core, it's about upholding the values we hold dear in our societies. Transparency, in the age where algorithms shape many of our daily decisions, understanding their mechanics is not just a technical necessity, but a democratic imperative. Accountability, our societies th thrive on the principle of responsibility. If an AI errs or discriminates, there must be a framework to address these consequences. Ethics and bias, we are duty bound to ensure that AI doesn't perpetuate existing biases, but is instead aids in creating a fairer society. As we stand on the brink of a new economic era, we must ponder on how to distribute AI's benefits equitably and protect against its potential misuse. Now, casting our gaze towards Latin America, a region of vibrant cultures and emerging economies, the AI landscape is both promising and challenging. In sectors ranging from agriculture to smart cities, AI initiatives are gaining traction in our region. However, the regulatory terrain is diverse. While some nations are taking proactive measures, others are still finding their own footing. However, the road to a unified regulatory framework faces certain stumbling blocks in our region. Like for example, fragmentation due to inconsistent inter-country coordination. I mean, we lack um, the coordination and integration that Europe ha has nowadays. We have deeply technological gaps that are attributed to varied adoption rates and expertise level. And we have infrastructure challenges that sometimes hamper consistent and widespread AI application. But let's not just dwell on challenges let's try to architect some solutions together. So first I will suggest that we require some sort of regional coordination. So for that purpose, we could establish a dedicated entity to harmonize AI regulation across Latin America, fostering unity in diversity. Also, I would suggest to promote the creation of technology sharing platforms that would allow for the creation of collaborative platforms where countries can share AI tools, solutions, and expertise, bridging the technological gap. Also, I would suggest some investment in shared infrastructure for our region. Consider like pooling resources to build regional digital infrastructure, ensuring that even nations with limited resources have access to foundational AI tech. Unique challenges also present themselves. Infrastructure discrepancies, variances in technology access, and a mosaic of data privacy norms necessitate a nuanced approach in our region. But herein also lies the opportunity. AI has the potential to address regional challenges, whether it's delivering healthcare to remote Amazonian villages or predicting and mitigating the impact of natural disasters. So what path forward do I envision for Latin America and indeed the global community? So first I will you know, suggest regional synergies are key Latin American countries, by sharing best practices and even setting regional standards, can craft and harmonize AI narrative. Second, I highly encourage stakeholder involvement. A diverse core of voices from technologists to the industry to civil society and ethicists must shape actively the AI regulatory dialogue in our region. We also need capacity building. I mean, we have a, a huge technological gap in our region, and I think that investment in education and research is non-negotiable. Preparing our global citizenry for AI augmented future is a shared responsibility with the world. Uh, finally, I would also encourage to strengthen data privacy and protection, and to try to harmonize the fragmented a regulatory scheme that we are having now in LATAM, because I think that could lead to a balkanization of technology, which will only hamper 
innovation uh, and we're only like like put us many years back so in conclusion as we stand at this confluence of technology policy and ethics i urge all stakeholders to approach ai with a balance of enthusiasm and caution together we can harness the potential of ai in order to advance the latin american agenda thank you all for your attention and i very really look forward to our collective deliberations around this pivotal issue thank you very much thank you very much daniel for these interesting insights because in particular people coming from europe like me although my country is not a formal member of the european union um, i think we are have a very well developed cooperation and also some harmonization of standards not just through the Council of Europe when it comes to human rights, democracy and rule of law, but also economic standards. And it is important to know that this is not necessarily the case in other continents where you have lots of uh, greater diversity of rules and standards in, in, in different ways, so, and which is of course a challenge also. And I think your, your ideas, your solutions to, to <clears throat> overcome these challenges are very, very valuable. Let me now turn uh, to uh, Professor uh, Lai Ming Su, I hope I pronounce it correctly. Um, he's a research director at the Australia's National Science Agency and a full professor of the University of South Wales. Um, so let us continue with the same topic from move to another region, to uh, Asia Pacific actually, and uh, <clears throat> he, uh, Lai Ming Su has been closely involved in developing best practices for AI governance and worked on the problem of operationalizing responsible AI. So the floor is yours. Yep. <laughs> Thanks very much uh, for this opportunity. It's a great honor to join this panel. And uh, so I'm from CSRO, which is Australia's National Science Agency. And we have a part uh, called Data 61. Um, if you're wondering why Data 61, 61 is Australian's country code when you call Australian. It's, it's business unit doing research on AI, digital, and data. So just back a little bit on the Australian journey on AI governance and responsible AI. So Australia is one of the very few countries uh, back in 2019, late 2018 actually, started uh, developing our AI ethics framework. So Data61 actually was the one leading the industry consultation and came up in middle 2019, the Australian AI ethics framework, uh, which is the high level principles. Um, and we observe it's uh, principles are similar to many of the principles in, in other world and globally. But interestingly, it has three elements of, uh, in it. One is, it's not just on high level ethical principles and it recognizes uh, human values uh, with a plural, uh, being a different uh, part of the community have different types of values and the importance of trade-offs and the robust discussion. The second part of it is included many of the traditional challenging uh, quality attributes like reliability, safety, security, and privacy. And I realized AI will make those kind of challenges even more challenging. And the third part of the AI access framework included something quite unique to AI, such as accountability, transparency, explainability, um, and contestability. Uh, that AI, uh, although they are very important in any digital software, but AI will make those things more difficult. And since then, uh, Australia has been focusing on operationalizing responsible AI, especially led by Data Web. In the meantime, uh, other agencies like Human Rights Commissioner, uh, uh, the, the Human Rights Commissioner, Lauren Finlay, when he heard about this uh, particular topic uh, at this forum, she was very excited and she forwarded uh, our recent UN submission uh, on uh, AI governance. And also, you may bump into the e-safety commissioner from Australia in this forum, and she's looking after some of the e-safety aspects of AI challenges as well uh, in this forum. But uh, then the government actually launched, about two years ago, the Australian National AI Center. The Australian National AI Center, hosted by Data Tixuan, is not a, a research center. It's an AI adop adoption center. Interestingly, its central theme is responsible AI at scale. So he has created a number of think tanks, including AI inclusion and diversity, uh, responsible AI, and AI at scale to navigate, to help Australian industry navigate the challenge of adopting AI responsibly in everything we do. Um, in the meantime, as a science agency, you know, I'm a scientist in AI, uh, we have been working on 
the best practices, bridging this gap that Francesca has mentioned. How do we get high level principles into something on the ground that uh, you know, organizations and developers and AI experts can use? So we have developed a pattern-based approach uh, for this. A pattern is just a reusable solution, a reusable best practice. But interestingly, in the pattern, not only uh, you have the best practice, but it also captures the context of the best practice and also the pros and the cons of this best practice. Not all best practices come to free, and also many best practices are, need to be connected. There are so many guidelines, uh, sometimes for governance, some, sometimes for AI engineers. Uh, there are a lot of disconnection between them. But when you connect those powerful best practices together and you see how the, the society, the technology companies, uh, the governing bodies can make things uh, responsible AI more effectively implemented. Another key focus of our approach from Australian is on the system level. So much of AI discussion has been talking about the AI model. You have this AI model, and you need to give it more data to train it, to align it, to make it better. But remember, every single system we use, including ChatGPT and others, is the overall system. The system utilizes some of the AI model. There are a lot of system, system level guardrails we need to build in. And those system level guardrails are actually capturing the context of the use. And without context, many of the risks and the responsible AI practice are not going to be very effective. So a system level approach going beyond the machine learning models, uh, another key elements uh, of our work. The next key elements we have is, as I mentioned earlier, is realizing the trade-offs uh, we have to make in many of this discussion. For people familiar with data governance, we know there's a trade-off between data utility and privacy. Uh, you can't get both. And to how much data utility you need to sacrifice, sacrificing the value of data for privacy, and vice versa, how much privacy you can afford to sacrifice and for maximizing data utility, this is not a question for scientists to answer. However, science plays two very important roles. One is to push the boundaries of the, the, the utility versus privacy curve, meaning for the same amount of privacy, we could do new science to make sure uh, more utility is extracted. Uh, in the, in the high-level panel this morning, you have heard of you know, federated machine learning and many other technologies has been advanced to enable this better trade-off, uh, getting better from both worlds. But importantly, it's not only utility and privacy. There's also tr fairness. You may have heard a story uh, that when we actually uh, uh, trying to preserve privacy without collecting certain data, it will also harm fairness in some cases. So now you have three quality attributes you have to treat off. Utility, privacy, fairness, and then there are more. So how science can enable that the decision makers to make that informed decision is the key of our work. Um, the next uh, uh, characteristic of our work uh, from Australian is to look at the supply chain. No one is building AI from ground up. You always rely on other vendor companies' AI models. You may be using pre-trained model. How, how can you be sure what is AI in your organization? So similar to some of the work in software builds of materials, uh, we have been developing AI builds of materials. So you can sure, be sure that what sort of AI is in your system and have that accountability being held um, and shared among different players in the supply chain. And the fi final thing we have just embarked on working is to look at responsible AI and AI governance through the lens of ESG. Of course, ESG stands for Environment, Social, and Governance, and very aligned with the SDG of UN um, goals. On the other hand, you know, environment is your AI footprint, environment footprint. Social element, um, AI plays a very important role, and the governance of AI often is too much um, of you know, internal company governance, but the societal impact of AI needs to be governed as well. So looking at uh, responsible AI through the lens of ESG will also make sure investors uh, can drive the levers of doing better uh, responsible AI. So I will conclude by saying that uh, Australian's approach is really looking at connecting those practices, enable the stakeholders to make the right uh, choices and trade-offs, and, and those trade-offs are not for us to make. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liming, and it's interesting to hear you talking about trade-offs and yeah, how we can turn this, maybe change them from 
perceived trade-offs to perceived opportunities if we get the right combinations of these goals. So uh, let me turn to our last, uh, but not least, uh, expert, which is um, somebody that comes from the country hosting this IGF uh, this year from Japan. Professor Emma is an associate professor at the Institute for Future Initiatives of the University of Tokyo, and her primary interest is to investigate the benefits and risks of AI in interdisciplinary research groups. She's very active in Japan's initiatives on AI governance, and I would like to give her the floor to uh, talk about how Japanese actors, industry, civil society, and regulators see the issue of regulation or governance of AI. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much, Chair uh, Dr. Thomas. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, thank, uh, I am really be honored to here to make some of the presentations and share what's being discussed uh, here in Japan also with my colleagues. <laughs> So um, as uh, Thomas nicely introduced uh, me, so I am, uh, I, I am right now at the academic, the University of Tokyo, but also I am a board member of the uh, Japan Deep Learning Association. It's uh, more of the, like the, in, uh, the startup and companies uh, community. And also uh, I am also a member of the uh, uh, AI Strategic Council uh, and the the Japanese government. Uh, however, uh, t today's this talk, I would like to wear the academic hats uh, on it, and uh, I would like to talk about what's being discussed here in Japan. And uh, uh, so far, I, I see a lots of uh, uh, the, the sharing uh, insights that being discussed uh, with the panelists. And uh, when we, uh, when I would like to uh, introduce to what's being, what, what kind of the status or what, what kind of discussion uh, was. Uh, 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 ongoing here in Japan. So uh, back in 2016, uh, it was like that was the uh, G7 summit uh, at the Taka Matsu. Uh, so before 2023, there was once uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, summit, and uh, there, uh, Japan Japanese government uh, released the the guidelines to the uh, AI. Uh, development. And I, I think, I believe that uh, that was actually the turning point that the global uh, uh, d d the discussion about the AI guidelines uh, actually started and uh, with the collaboration. And uh, this year, or the 2023, as the, the G7 summit at the Hiroshima, uh, we also uh, see that the, uh, there's a, the, 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 the very huge debate discussion on the ongoing and the generative AI, and uh, currently uh, the G7 and also the uh, other related comp companies, uh, countries are discussing about the uh, way to uh, create the rules uh, to govern the, the generative AI and also uh, the AI in general, and that's called the Hiroshima AI process. And I believe uh, there will be uh, the discussion mm -hmm. tomorrow uh, morning. And uh, uh, with, with that, uh, uh, the Ministry of Internal Communication Affairs and also the uh, Ministry of Economic uh, and Trade and Government uh, Ministry is also uh, creating the guidelines uh, to uh, discuss uh, uh, the, the, the development of the AI and also to mitigate the risks. So, um, so that, that kind of thing is right now ongoing here in Japan, but uh, before uh, going to the, the, the discuss the further about the AI uh, with the responsible uh, use, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about the AI convention that's actually the, the COE is uh, uh, going, going under the negotiation. So uh, why I'm here is that because I am actually uh, very interested in the AI convention and uh, my colleagues and I are uh, actually uh, 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 organized an event here in Japan to discuss uh, what's the impact uh, towards the Japanese and also to the, the other world. And uh, actually we are creating some of the policy recommendation uh, for the Japanese government. So if we are to sign this uh, convention, what kind of thing we should uh, investigate on? And uh, I, I think uh, this is a really important uh, convention uh, uh, to uh, so, so that uh, uh, that uh, we, when we uh, are to discuss the responsible uh, AI, and uh, in order to uh, make some of the uh, points that should be discussed uh, within this uh, panel, I would like to raise some of the uh, three points that we uh, published uh, last month in September uh, from uh, uh, my institution. 
Uh, the title is called the Toward Responsible AI Deployment Policy Recommendation for the Hiroshima AI Process. Uh, if you are interested in, uh, just uh, search for my institution's name and uh, the, the policy recommendation, and you can find out. And uh, in there, uh, we uh, had this kind. Of, we, we we created this policy recommendation with a multi-discussion, multi-stakeholder discussion, including not only the academics but also from the uh, from the industry. And also, we actually uh, has a discussion with the government officials. Uh, and uh, there, uh, one thing we are we we think really important or the, uh, is that. Uh, uh, the interoperability of the frameworks. So the framework interoperability of the AI is one of the key words uh, that's been discussed in the G7 summit uh, this year. But I guess many of us have questions, what does the interoperability mean? And, uh, and there, uh, for our understanding, is that we need somehow the transparency about each of the regulations uh, or the, each of the frameworks uh, that actually disciplines uh, this AI development and also the usage. And uh, in, in this sense, I think this AI convention is really uh, important because, uh, you know, as, as, as explained here, the, the AI convention is a framework convention, and each country has its own um, uh, may, it, it will take their own measures uh, to, to this AI innovation and also the risk mitigation. And uh, uh, it, it's really important to respect to each other's, the other country's uh, culture uh, or, or the, how they regulate the artificial intelligence and uh, how, how actually they uh, can uh, connect to each, each other's uh, frameworks. And uh, it's, it's really important that uh, uh, each country uh, has this uh, uh, the clear uh, explainability, accountability of uh, what's the, the role of the, each stakeholder has, what will be the responsibility, and how they can uh, uh, supervise whether that kind of uh, uh, measurement uh, is actually working. Uh, uh, and. Uh, in, in that sense, uh, I, I think uh, that that kind of interoperability and also this AI convention uh, have, have somehow uh, uh, has uh, really uh, important uh, views uh, to share. And also, uh, the, the next point I, I, we actually raised as the, my our policy recommendation is that uh, how we actually uh, uh, considers about the responsibility. And uh, I, th I think uh, the other panelists also discussed, but uh, I think uh, what is important thing is that uh, to, to discuss about the, the responsibility of the, the, the developers, the deployers, and also the users. Uh, however, the regulation is especially important uh, regarding the user side. And uh, because there's a power, you know, the, the power imbalance between the users and the developers. So uh, what, what we have to do is that uh, uh, we, we, not only the, the rules of the regulation, but also we need to uh, discuss the, how to uh, empower the citizens to create, uh, you know, to, to empower and to, to, uh, to hire their literacy uh, so that they can judge what the AI uh, actually uh, has, uh, what kind of developed. And uh, I am really uh, happy to hear that the, the professor actually raised like, the, the, the ESGs, like how, how the investors are also uh, very important stakeholders. So not only the rules or the regulation by the legal framework, but the actually there's a lot of discipline that we can actually use. So for example, like the investors' uh, investment or maybe the reputation uh, and also like the literacy. So we, we, can, we can, and also actually the technology itself as well. So there's a lot of uh, measurement that we can take. And uh, uh, to, to, with, with all that things uh, concerned, uh, I think uh, we can create a more you know, uh, better or the more responsible AI systems uh, or the AI uh, in, in implemented society as a whole. And uh, in the last part, lastly, uh, but not least, what we uh, also emphasize is the importance of the multi-stakeholder discussion. And I, I believe that the, here the, the IGF is uh, one of the uh, a very uh, good uh, timing uh, that uh, we actually discuss this here because uh, uh, we actually, uh, th there's a Hiroshima air process ongoing and uh, lots of countries uh, right now are dealing with uh, 
uh, their own regulatory frameworks. And uh, as I said, Japanese government is also creating these uh, guidelines uh, or maybe updating the guidelines. And uh, with, with that, this is the, actually the place we actually share what have been discussed or wh what we can share the values. And uh, the, the important value that actually the Council of Europe raises, the, the democracy, human rights, and uh, the rule of all. That, uh, that important values we share. And with that, uh, uh, we can have the transparency and also the, uh, the, this kind of framework interoperability to discuss and to make these principles or the policy into practices. And uh, so that, with, with that, I, I will stop here, but uh, I, I really appreciate to be in this panel. Thank you very much, Arisa. And um, before I react to, I would like to encourage people to, uh, those that want to interact, please get, stand up and, and, and go to the microphones. We have a little less uh, time than planned. Uh, for, for the interactive discussion, but we do have a little bit of time. Um, I think what, what this uh, panel has shown is that um, although we share the same, the same goals, we do have different systems, we do have different traditions, cultures, not just legally, but also socially, and of course it is a great challenge, and, and uh, as uh, Risa has also said, um, if we want to develop this common framework, uh, uh, with the Council of Europe, but not just for European countries, for all countries around the world. One of the biggest challenges is indeed, and, and, and we've heard a few hints, how to, one thing is how to have governments commit themselves to follow some rules. This is the, uh, the, the easy part, let's say, uh, in a convention where governments can commit to keep uh, sticking to some rules. But since we have so differing systems of how to make the private sector respect human rights, uh, contribute positively and not negatively to democracy. How do we deal with these differences? How, we, what is the, how do we responsibilize private sector actors in a way that they can be innovative, but that they contribute positively and not negatively to, to our values? So this is one of the key challenges also for us working on this, um, on this convention, because we cannot just rely on one continent or one country's framework. We have to find the common ground between different frameworks. So having said this, I'm happy to see a few people take the floor. Please introduce yourself with your name briefly, and then uh, make your comment or ask your question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. My name is Christoph Zeng. I'm the founder of uh, AAA.AI Association, based in Geneva, Switzerland. And my uh, question regards a continuation of the topic that we just covered regarding responsibility and trade-offs. Uh, continuing on this question, I would like to raise um, what I call a right of humans in comparison to the rights of hum the, the human rights. Isn't it the right of humans to endure the test of, t the test of time? In order to endure the test of time, is it a right or duty of collective sacrifice? Is it a right or duty to redefine some of our most fundamental beliefs and values? If there was a solution which could deliver a, solu which could deliver a way to, to that right, but which could require us to relent temporarily or risk relenting permanently, some of our human rights as defined for the declaration because of speed or because of need for consultation. For that right to endure the test of time, speed versus right, consultation versus sovereignty, right versus rights. If there existed a binary choice at some point, ladies and gentlemen, what right ought we to choose? And my question extends to also our colleague at IBM and the broader uh, world communities. If we are to not try to solve all problems at the same time, but instead jointly solve specific questions and tackle the overall question jointly, are we accepting to sacrifice the speed of decision making or would we accept that one way makes at some critical point in time for the enduring of humans as a species, some decisions which require speed be re beyond reasonably possible by a fully democratic process to be made slightly less democratically. 
for those to whom democracy is dearest. And some decisions which require global consultation to be made slightly more democratically for those to whom democracy compacts a challenge to overcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. You pose an interesting question, uh, if, I, if I can try and summarize it. Will we need the right to stay human beings and not turn into machines uh, because we may have to compete with machines? Uh, that's uh, at least uh, some aspects I think I've, I've heard. Let's take another comment and, uh, and then see what the reactions are. Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you for recognizing me. I'm Ken Kata. I'm a, I'm a sensei knows I have a work in the manufacturing industry, but I have an academic hat uh, with Keio University. Uh, my topic relates to the, some of the American speakers and the concern about bias. So within uh, the Japanese academic um, world that I live in, our concern is about bias, um, being in the sense that the platformers got Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon are basically quote unquote American companies. So who decides these algorithms? Um, in the, when we look at the United States, we see extremely uh, wide, uh, like in, in the case of abortion um, or, or politics, there are many issues that are very le uh, divided in the United States. And then so if, if, the, if the platformers are deciding the, these issues, in the end, even if it's technically possible to try to avoid the bias, who in the end actually decides um, which, which um, uh, answer to go with? Thank you. Thank you very much. So let me turn, turn to, the, to the panel uh, on these two issues or questions. One is like, yeah, how can we stay humans and, and uh, given also the competition, the growing competition with machines? And the other one is, I think about, about bias and, and where, it's not just the AI, AI systems, it's also the, the data, of course, that, that shape the bias. And of course, data is not evenly spread across the world, but there's more data from some regions, from some people than from others. So whoever wants to react, maybe we give precedence to the ones that are physically present. Thank you. Oh, thanks, thanks very much. I think we have a lot of uh, experts online and, and Professor Emma is here. So just very briefly, reversely, I think the, who, who makes those decisions, as I alluded to earlier, I mean, as a scientist, and, and I, I think all the developers, all the AI providers, it's not, not their decisions to make. Uh, it's the ability to actually uh, expose some of these trade-offs to allow the democratic process to have that debate with data and informed decision, and then there's a dial like privacy, utility, and fairness, and they decide where to implement, then the technology assures that implementation is throughout all the system, properly monitored, and, and can be improved uh, by pushing the scientific boundary. I think in terms of AI and human competing, certainly there's a, there's a concern. I mean, when, when AlphaGo beat human in Go, I mean, these days you may know, there's, uh, people used to say there might be worrying, people stop playing chess and Go. But at this moment of in history, the number of people interested in playing Go and chess is historically high, and the number of grandmasters in Go and chess is historically high. The reason being, you know, human find the meaning uh, in those work and the game, they will continue to do that. Even AI surpasses them. They learn from AI, they work with AI, uh, they, they make a better society, I think. But that speed of change might be too fast sometimes for us to cope. Yeah, so um, uh, I guess the important thing that we, we should discuss or that we, sh we should be aware is that uh, it's, although we are talking about the artificial intelligence as a technology, but it's more like, as, as the professor said, it's a system. So it's not only the AI algorithm, but AI models, but it's more like AI systems, AI services. And within that systems, the human beings are also included. So we have to discuss about like the human-machine interaction the, or the human-machine collaboration. Uh, in, in, that, in that way, uh, maybe uh, uh, the partially uh, kind of responded to it, the, the, the both questions is that, uh, that uh, uh, so we, we need to we, we, we actually actually don't have the clear answer but uh, we have to discuss the uh, the human machine interaction and also the human biases are already included into this kind of uh, human machine you know uh, the, the systems so uh, from the academic hats uh, on my on my head I, I would like to uh, say that uh, we need to uh, focus more on this cultural and also uh, the interdisciplinary uh, discussion on the human machine interaction with artificial intelligence. 
Thank you very much. We are uh, approaching the end of this session, and uh, I'd just like to, to maybe close with one, one remark um, that maybe shows that I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I'm an economist and a historian, and whenever we talk about the, um, the crucial moments that we are at the edge of history becoming completely different than before, uh, this is also something that every generation in every, every point of history thought, and if we look back uh, around 200 years or 150 years when the combustion engine was spreading all over uh, continents um, that also had a huge effect. It did not replace like what AI is, is about to do, uh, cognitive labor, but it replaced physical labor by machines that you can actually, that where you find a lot of comparisons. If you take engines uh, and compare them, what they did, they were used in all kinds of machines to either produce something or to move something or somebody from A to B. And uh, we learned to deal with engines. We have developed not just one piece of legislation, but hundreds of norms, technical, legal, social norms for engines used in different kinds of contexts. And we've been, for instance, if you take traffic, traffic legislation, we've been able to reduce the number of dead people in car accidents significantly. Uh, at the same time, the biggest challenge is like how to reduce the CO2 emissions in engines, we are still struggling after 200 years of using engines on how to solve that problem. So, um, yeah, and there's ma many more uh, analogies between AI systems and engines, but also differences because AI systems are not physically placed somewhere, but can be moved and reproduced much easier than uh, engines. But I'm uh, very delighted by this discussion, and I hope that we will continue. There's a number of AI-related sessions this week in, in, in this IGF. I'm part of a few of, of these, and uh, I hope to see you again also in the couloirs, because I'm really interested in, together with you, finding a solution on how this Council of Europe Convention can be a global instrument that will not also not solve all the problems, but help us to get closer together to solve uh, to f successfully uh, use AI for the good and not for the bad. So thanks a lot for, for this session and uh, see you soon. Thank you.